Good afternoon and welcome to the Perspectives on Climate Change Seminar. This is really the first seminar of the semester, at least the first public seminar. And for this first seminar, we're really happy to have um, Ariel Ortiz Bobea here. He's an um, associate professor in the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management here at Cornell. His interests span agricultural, environmental and development economics and his research programs broadly focus on agricultural sustainability issues with particular emphasis on the statistical and econometric evaluation of climate change impacts and adaptation in agriculture and other sectors of the um, economy. Prior to joining Cornell um, 2014, he was a research fellow at the Resources for the Future, a nonpartisan think tank in DC. And he served as a special assistant to the Minister of the Environment of the Dominican Dominican Republic. So Ariel, um, great, thank you for coming in to um, talk with us. It's a real pleasure to have you here for our first seminar. Thank you so much, Peter, for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here and to kick off uh, this great seminar series of some amazing speakers and uh, in the, the semester, uh, be sure to be on the other side um, of uh, the Zoom wall uh, uh, in, in future iterations. So. I'll start by uh, sharing uh, my slides to make sure that everything's in order. Can you see things clearly? We can. And then just as a reminder to the audience before you begin, is um, mm -hmm. you can put your questions in the Q&A. So if you have some clarifying questions during the seminar, you can put them there. And then Ariel will um, so set up time at the end for further questions. Great. OK, so let's kick it off. Um, so again, thanks for coming and uh, listening to my talk. Um, this is a project uh, that is joint with a couple of Cornell colleagues. So uh, Toby Alt and Carlos Carrillo, who are in the Earth and Atmospheric Science Department, um, but also with Bob Chambers at the University of Maryland and David Lobel at Stanford. And this project started maybe almost two years ago um, after I had a conversation with a, um, with a journalist um, following a paper that I uh, published uh, uh, in 2019 and and uh, well, late 2018. And it, it came from a frustration, my frustration, of not being able to answer the questions the journalist was asking. And the question was, back then, uh, where are the places in the world where climate change is already having a measurable impact on agricultural production? And I could not, I could, you know, I could uh, say things on, uh, you know, broad, uh, you know, qualitatively speaking, I, I could uh, offer some ideas, but I could not really answer the question. And um, and when I looked, it wasn't clear that the answer was out there. And so that's what started this project. And uh, here it is. So uh, it's in a, a fairly advanced stage at this point. Um, so I'm I'm very happy to be uh, sharing this with you. So so before I get into uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, what we did. Um, I'll start a little bit with the motivation and and first taking um, sort of taking stock about how far we've gone as humans um, over the past say 60 years. Uh, and so so what I'm showing you here is how much the population has grown since 1960. So the the two dots that you see here are the first one in, in 61 uh, where uh, our data starts and then the last one is in 2015. Uh, there and what you see the number there to 239 it's really an index where 100 was back in 61 and so what this means is that population has more than doubled uh, since 1960 uh, nowadays it's about you know 7.8 billion people so if you uh, follow here on the right hand uh, side you can see that it you know this is about where we are uh, and so we're more than double so more than double the population in the world over the same time period agricultural production has more than tripled, okay? So this is great. It means that there's more food per capita than ever before in the world. But uh, production doesn't come from, you know, so this uh, encompasses all types of agricultural production from, uh, you know, animal products um, and, um, and also uh, crops, right? Um, but at the same time, when you look at uh, where is this production coming from, it's also from inputs, right? So when you look at inputs, you're talking about chemicals, uh, materials, um, you know, labor, um, land, how much has that evolved over time? And that quantity of aggregate inputs uh, at a global scale has more than doubled. So what that means is that it's 
output is growing faster than inputs. And what that means is that a lot of the growth in output is coming from growth in productivity. What that means is that we're producing more food per unit of input than ever before. And that increase, that acceleration in the productivity, um, in productivity growth um, has been driven still not most of the growth in, um, in, in the global output, but a big chunk. And, and I think that this is where the future uh, lies is it means that we need to produce more with what we have, right? So we cannot really think about the future agricultural system where we're only going to, you know, bring more land or more chemicals, uh, you know, more land into production and add chemicals in order to produce more food. So we need to be just more productive, um, than we've ever been before. So I see, I, I see um, uh, yeah, I'll talk about productivity in a second, exactly the definitions here. Um, so aggregate output is, um, you know, so economies aggregate output in the same way that um, aggregate other types of outputs for other uh, industries. So it, it depends on the value of the agricultural out, uh, product that we're talking about. And so this is aggregating all the outputs. Uh, they're the same for all the inputs. Okay, now get to what, um, agricultural productivity means here. And it's a particular measure that economists use called total factor productivity um, that I'll define in a second. Oh, okay. So one thing that we need to realize is that that measure of productivity that I showed that is rising, uh, it's rising very differently in different places. So the map here shows uh, a figure from USDA from the Economic Research Service uh, ERS. And uh, you can see how some countries uh, like China and Brazil are growing at a very fast rate uh, here in dark red, but there's some other, other places in the world where uh, productivity growth in agriculture is stagnating, meaning that they're not, even if they're producing more, they're producing more because they're putting more inputs, not because they're becoming uh, more productive over time. So this is gonna be, this is a major challenge, uh, especially that, um, you know, in order to produce, you know, to uh, increase, to uh, raise uh, living standards, we need to become more productive. Um, especially for uh, rural um, dwellers. So this is a, a big challenge. So bringing back to the, to the global figure that I had before, I think the, 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 what's um, um, interesting about this figure is thinking about the future, right? So we keep a lot, you know, thinking about, you know, we, population is rising. What I'm showing now are the, project, the UN projections um, um, till the end of the century. And the question is, what's going to happen to these different lines, right? How is output at the aggregate scale going to be uh, evolving over the, the next uh, 75 years? Um, and what's going to happen to productivity, okay? Uh, we know what we would like to have, right? But uh, is that really what's, uh, what's going to happen? So a lot of emphasis has been, putting, has been put to the, to the future forward looking. Um, and, and especially that here we don't, really show who's the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is climate change. Um, when we look at the future, right? So these are future scenarios of uh, what um, the global temperatures might be uh, under different um, sort of forcing scenarios. And the, the, the magnitude of the projected changes are unprecedented. So they're so large that we haven't seen them before uh, in our historical uh, you know, record. And, and so this is kind of one of the challenge, challenges that when we think about this figure, right? Population is growing, but then we have these other challenges also coming up. But a lot of the emphasis has been of the future. And we tend to think about climate change as something that is, you know, we look at these projections, oh, look at RCP 8.5, uh, the massive warming, but it doesn't really recognize our, our, our sort of obsession about what's coming up in the next several decades is that when you look at what has already happened, Okay, it is not a flat line. Okay, this is not a flat line. It's not as steep here as uh, we're projecting to happen in the next few decades, but it's not a flat line. It means that the climate has already changed. When we look at the historical record uh, since the pre, uh, pre industrial uh, at times, uh, depending on what data set, you, it doesn't really matter. The global average temperature has risen. Uh, we're about you know one degree C um, over landed oceans. If you just look at uh, land, uh, you get even uh, more warming because it's warming faster um, over land. But there's already a substantial change in our climate system. And if we think that climate is an important factor of production for agriculture, then the question is, well, how has this historical change in climate already affected um, agriculture? Right. 
Um, so previous work trying to answer similar questions um, have mostly focused on um, attributing the impact of recent trends. So people looking back, say, since the 1980s and seeing how recent trends in climate in different parts of the world have, in, have affected uh, yield trends. So a lot of this work is on crop yields. Uh, so there's uh, papers in environmental research letters, some in science and uh, recent paper um, by Fran Moore. Uh, it, it's a preprint uh, posted in Earth, uh, Earth Archive um, where it's only about cereal crop yields, mostly about cereal crop yields. Um, there's a recent uh, paper by Noah Diffenbach and, and Marshall Burke in, in PNAS in 2019 where they go not on crop yields, but they go total GDP for the whole for the whole uh, um, globe based on a recent work uh, in, in, a, in a different paper. And um, what what that misses is that when you're talking about total GDP for the whole economy, you're those that GDP is mostly dominated by non-agricultural sectors, right? So uh, ag is a relatively small; it's an important but relatively small share. Um, of GDP at the global scale. It is larger, obviously, for some countries than others. Um, but just looking at total GDP will miss the picture of what is happening to the agricultural sector. The second point is that cereal crops are only a, a relatively small share of the total value produced in agriculture. So it's so much emphasis on crop yields, particularly cereal crops, very important, rice, wheat, you know, you name it. But this is only when you add the value of all the cereal crops it hovers around 20% of the total value produced, as you can see on the, on the plot on the right, okay? Um, another thing that uh, we miss is that um, in, in some of these uh, earlier studies is that a lot of the emphasis is on, on yields, right? When we're talking about agriculture's yields without paying a lot of attention of what is happening to the input choices. So yields, um, you know, farmers respond to weather conditions they might increase uh, you know, use of certain inputs in response to say a drought or an extreme uh, weather event. And generally we don't capture that in these uh, studies where we're only measuring a partial measure of productivity like, uh, you know, uh, like crop yield, which is a, um, you know, doesn't really tell you what's happening with the other inputs other than land, okay? So I'll come back to this idea of trying to capture uh, things happening to, um, uh, to all inputs um, in, in a second. So, so just to make this clear, the research question is, right, what we're trying to answer here is how much has anthropogenic climate change already affected global agricultural productivity? And I'll define um, agricultural productivity more precisely uh, in a little bit. So the overall approach, we're going to all go over a, a sort of a general overview, but one thing, especially that um, there's a climate scientist here in the, in the audience, um, oh, see, what are cereal crops? So cereal crops, uh, you know, like rice, uh, wheat, um, you know, so these are major staple, uh, um, you know, corn uh, or maize um, are cereal crops. Things that are not cereal crops, um, you know, soybeans. Um, um, so in terms of field crops, right, cotton is not a, a cereal crop. So this is a category, very important category um, that, uh, that uh, we rely on for our energy uh, consumption. Um, okay, there's more questions than I can follow. So I'll keep going and then I'll come back to these. Otherwise you'll get me derailed. Uh, so I'll keep going. Um, the, the, overall, the approach that we're gonna take here in this study is the following. Uh, we're gonna harness something that client scientists uh, generate, which are these counterfactual climate uh, you know, simulations. So if you're familiar with uh, CIMIP5, which is a, a intercomparison project uh, that compares the output of many models. So you have many modeling groups, climate modeling groups that get together and they agree on what the experiments are gonna run so that they can compare the output of their models and sort of tweak and, and improve climate modeling uh, over time. And some of the experiments that they do is uh, something like this historical um, uh, experiment where they try to just input exactly the observed levels of um, forcing uh, in the atmosphere that uh, we have uh, put out as humans. So you put exactly how much you know, CO2 or uh, greenhouse gases we put in, and then you try to simulate uh, what is the uh, change in global temperatures um, uh, in, in this experiment. So this is trying to kind of replicate, not reproduce, but replicate uh, the historical uh, conditions that we've seen. Um, uh, the, the blue band here shows you kind of the ensemble 
of all the models from CIMIP5 and what they say the global temperatures ought to be if you have the forcing uh, that we've had uh, in, you know, since, you know, historically. The, the, the black line is the actual observation. So this is exactly kind of the figure that I showed uh, a few slides ago, where you actually see the observations of the temperature, global temperatures rising. And the great thing is that this black line falls within the range of the blue line. So these models, these experiments are sort of reproducing, replicating uh, the historical patterns that we see at a global scale. The great thing about a model is that you can play around and you can play, let's say, God for a second, and you can change things from the system. One of them is that you can remove human influence from, from these climate models and see what happens. Okay, so that's exactly what uh, climate scientists did in that IST NAT, so historical natural um, uh, experiment. And what you, they do there is that they leave all the natural forcings, like volcanoes and other things, and um, that that are unrelated to humans. And you you see what would have happened. And what you see is that that world would have been considerably cooler, right? Than what we actually got. Okay, so so this um, uh, this is a, a, a common thing that people use in the uh, uh, detection and attribution literature in climate science, and we're going to use results or output from climate models from these experiments to link them to statistical model, econometric models of agricultural productivity and weather to back out what the impact of anthropogenic climate change has been on, on agricultural productivity. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be very critical. That's why I put it at the, in front so that you are already familiar that this is what we're gonna be um, also, uh, uh, you know, we'll be harnessing. And that's why we have an interdisciplinary team and Toby and Carlos or climate scientists here at Cornell are also part of the team. Okay, so overall, the big picture about the approach is gonna be first, we're going to estimate an econometric model. An econometric model is just a fancy way of saying statistical model applied to economic data. Um, and, uh, and that model will describe how agriculture, and, and still not putting specific names on, on the variables that we're going to use, I'll get that to, to in a second, how agriculture responds to changes in weather. From year to year, if the weather is, say, more wet, you know, is it drier, hotter, cooler, how does productivity change from one year to the next because of these weather conditions? So we were first gonna characterize that relationship. The next step is to rely on output from climate models uh, with and without human forcing. So with and without anthropogenic climate change. And we're going to, once we couple these, we can then simulate what would be the growth in productivity in those contrafact in those two different worlds, right? by taking the difference, right? So that's what we did in, in that uh, third step. We combined these two steps and then we can back out uh, the cumulative impact uh, on productivity in these two, uh, in two, in these two worlds. Um, Peter, so if there's questions there that merit my attention immediately, then let me know. Otherwise I'll, I'll keep going uh, so that uh, I fear that I may be running out of time. Um, okay. Okay, I think we should keep going for now. Okay, good. Um, so this is the overall approach. Um, so let me just tell you a, a little bit about the key variable in our first step, which is the measure of total factor productivity. You saw that when I said productivity, loosely speaking, this is exactly what I mean. Total factor productivity is a measure that economists use uh, to capture um, overall trends in how productive our use of inputs is. Okay. So if you see, you know, technically what it measures, right, is the growth in production in output, so here change in output in Y, Y is output, that cannot be explained by growth in inputs, here measured by a change in X, right? So if you see like in US agriculture, you see US agriculture here um, uh, from, you know, over the past, uh, you know, 60 years, um, uh, 70 years almost, you see that a lot of the output, right? Uh, you know, output has been rising, at the same time, total inputs purchased by farmers, right, has remained, have remained, the mix has changed, but the overall quantity, when you aggregate them all up by their value and measuring by their value, it's, it has stagnated over time. What that means is that a lot of the growth in output that we've seen in U.S. agriculture has mostly been driven by productivity growth, okay? So any changing output that you cannot explained by changes in input, we say that's 
productivity growth. That's a total factor productivity growth, right? It can come from many different things, you know, being more efficient in the processes. It can be, um, you know, just uh, new varieties of uh, seeds that we're using, uh, more efficient tractors. There's a bunch of things that can explain um, um, uh, these trends. We're not trying to explain why is it changing. We're just observing that U.S. agriculture is becoming more, um, more um, productive over time. One of the key pieces, this is a loophole that we're going to explore, is that how does weather enter here? The farmers don't buy the weather, right? They don't say, uh, this year I want uh, it to be rainy, so I'm going to pay someone for, to bring the rainfall. You don't do that. Because of that, the way that the U.S. government measures inputs, it's actually an omitted input. They, cannot, they don't account for it, at least not yet. Uh, we're actually working, uh, researchers are working to uh, try to bring those free inputs in uh, as well into this measure of productivity. And you can see what happens is that in a year like 1983, you see this dip here, 1983, if you know a little bit about U.S. agriculture, you know that that was a massive drought in the Midwest. So droughts show up, you see a drop in output in that year. Um, you don't see a drop in inputs that same year, but it shows up as a drop in productivity like that year. So that means that for all the inputs that you put in, your output goes down. So you look less productive that year. And it's really just bad weather. So we're going to rely on this measure of productivity to capture all the responses that farmers, like uh, that uh, all, all farmers' responses uh, to a conditional, you know, basically we're going to capture kind of the effect on output conditional of all the input changes that farmers uh, um, operated. Okay, so mathematically, this is a very simple way to uh, characterize this. So Y would be the aggregate output. So imagine all of the agricultural production boiled down to one metric, okay? Milk, tomatoes, everyone in there, corn, soybeans, everything is in here in Y. And then you have an equation that, uh, you know, a simple form like this, uh, where X are, um, are inputs chosen by the farmer, you are unobserved inputs chosen for the farmer because we don't necessarily see everything. And Z here is weather, okay? So it can be a vector of weather conditions in there. Um, a is just a kind of a, a productivity, a neutral productivity term. The more productive we are, the more that A will grow over time. So if you take the log of this equation, you get the, the second one, right? And rearranging, taking the first differences of this equation. So the you know time period two minus time period one, you do that, you, you get a growth of total factor productivity. So by definition, total factor productivity is the growth in output minus the growth in inputs, okay? Measured inputs. So what this means is that the data that we get from the US government, which is uh, uh, TFP, this growth in output, is a combination of three components. One is the technological improvement. So the more, productive we are over time is captured here. That's the A term there, the uh, neutral productivity term. Then there's um, unobserved input changes. So these are changes uh, in inputs that we're not observing, okay? So those are also in the changes in productivity that we see. And there's also the unmeasured weather effects. So weather effects, you, you can see that sometimes, you know, you get um, uh, fluctuations in productivity that are driven by, by weather conditions, okay? So, so it's a, a combination of these three things uh, when we uh, observe these changes in productivity. So this is how the raw data looks like uh, that we're gonna use in our model. Uh, this is the, the level of output and the, on the top panel, the, the growth rate of that, um, annual growth rate of that output is on the, uh, at the bottom. Um, the inputs the, in levels are here in, in yellow on top and then the changing input, uh, the input growth rate, um, uh, you see it here in yellow in the bottom panel. So you see that there's years where output went down, as you can see here, because inputs went down, okay? But there are other years like this one, again, 1983, you see a massive drop in output without a commensurate drop in inputs. And that's really how we're gonna uh, pick up weather, right? So we're gonna pick up how output responds conditional on the input changes that were measured. Um, in, in every location. So that's our TFP metric. So total factor productivity metric that we're gonna be uh, relying on. So we have data from that for, um, uh, for a bunch of, for 
most of the countries in the world that the USDA puts together. Um, and again, one of the, the loopholes that we're going to be exploiting is that these metrics do not capture weather. So we're going to be uh, extra, we're going to be extracting the effect of weather on this measure of productivity uh, of productivity growth. Okay, so the em empirically, this is what we're going to do. I showed you the theoretical model, uh, which is here on top. So the change in TFP is basically a sum of these three components. And what we're really interested in is going to be in disease, right? But this is how we're going to control for the things that we don't really necessarily care about for this story. Uh, like the changes in uh, productivity over time, in, in, in impro technological improvements over time. Those are smooth processes, right? Like you don't become like kind of dumb from one year to the next. Um, you, you know, getting better at uh, techniques and things is a gradual process. So we're going to capture this via in different ways, uh, via dummies um, over time uh, and in space. So we're going to control for these trends. Um, here with these, uh, you know, location and um, and um, and time dummies in the empirical model. These are really what we want. So this is the these are the weather effects that we're trying to capture, and here we're representing them as a linear and quadratic terms of precipitation here in P and uh, temperature. Okay, um, I'll say more about uh, uh, different metrics uh, down the road, and then we have also an observed inputs that might be if they don't vary over time or they're varying slowly over time they would be captured with these dummies. Otherwise they end up in our error term. And I might talk about that uh, later if there's interest in talking about um, uh, uh, you know, bias from uh, omitted variables or time varying over time, et cetera. Okay, so that's our empirical model. In essence, we're trying to, our step one is getting weather conditions, right? Changes in weather conditions. And we want to explain how these affect changes in outcome. And our outcome variable is TFP. So we're trying to kind of describe statistically a response function uh, based on these uh, changes in weather and it changes in these outcome variable that it kind of summarizes how agricultural sector is doing as a whole. That's step one, the econometric part. Now we're moving to step two, which is where our climate colleagues come in. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna harness this output from climate models with anthropogenic climate change, and with anthropogenic climate change. And so these climate models, as I said, you know, you know what these climate models look like. Um, it's just gonna change the forcing in these models. And that's gonna give us different kind of weather trajectories. Weather trajectories for one country uh, where you, you, you see, uh, say the, the, here is temperature. You see temperatures rising faster in the world with anthropogenic climate change and uh, staying relatively more stable in uh, a world without anthropogenic climate change. Now, this is, uh, kind of a, this is actual data from uh, one of the models, but this is how it looks like so that you get a sense of the spatial nature of that. On the left, uh, it's the Hadley model. Uh, well, both are the Hadley model. The left hand side, what you see is sort of the downscale version of the output from, uh, from the GC engine. And you see that uh, uh, temperatures are rising, um, especially in this model in, uh, starting in the 90s. And then if you just remove human influences, um, you don't get the high temperatures that you're getting in the world, uh, you know, with anthropogenic climate change. So these are kind of, when I tell you about country level stuff, this is where the spatial resolution is going to come from. We're going to take this data that is very, you know, finely um, uh, gridded, and we're going to aggregate it to, uh, to each country. So step three is combining this. So this, the, 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 the response function we estimated with these contrafactual weather uh, uh, trajectories uh, coming from the, from the models. And, uh, and that would allow us to combine sort of two sources of uncertainty. The statistical uncertainty that comes from the relationship between weather and productivity, that's an uncertain relationship, right? And we capture it with those confidence bands here around the response function. And there's just a climate uncertainty coming from how much warming there is depending on uh, different uh, climate models, right? So some climate models have a higher climate sensitivity and you see more warming uh, than others. So we're also capturing sort of sampling from that distribution, from that uncertainty as well. So we're gonna mesh these two sources of uncertainty. So the results that I'm gonna show you will reflect both types of uncertainty, okay? There's actually a third type of uncertainty that I'll, that I'll talk about, it, which is about model choice. Um, here, so that this is one mod, one statistical model. There might be other statistical models, and, and then we actually sample from that um, um, additional source of uncertainty as well. 
This is the ugliest uh, slide in the presentation, <laughs> and it summarizes step one, two, three, okay, mathematically. Um, so I, I sort of already went over this, so I don't want to spend too much time here, but if you're interested in kind of, um, if you have a mathematical mind, then you might just like, you know, try to understand exactly what is happening here. Okay, in terms of the data, so I told you about the approach. Now we're going to get to the ingredients, what data we're going to use to do this, to do this analysis. First, we need the productivity data. Um, there's not that many places that have uh, productivity data uh, for the whole world. Uh, the only data set that we know of with an annual time step is the International Agricultural Productivity Data Set uh, from U.S. Department of Agriculture, ERS. Um, and it goes from 1961 to 2015, um, and it's a country level panel. So we have about 172 countries in the data set. Um, and I can go into a lot of details, but every country that had weather data and productivity data uh, is in the data set, okay? I'm being from a small country here, I made sure that every little island uh, <laughs> is in our data set, okay? So, um, but there's data, it's, this is like 99.5% of all the glo you know, global agricultural production is reflected uh, here in the study. Okay, um, this is more for an econ audience, um, how the, there's different ways of computing these TFP um, indices. Um, the, and, and this is how this one in particular is put together. So that you get a sense. The way that these are put together is that um, you're, you're, you're capturing sort of a weighted average of growth rates of output. So this is measured here in, uh, with the Y. Um, so, you know, an output can be uh, how much, you know, the tons you know, in quantities of maize in a particular year, how much did it grow from one year to the next, right? Uh, the same for livestock production, anything that is uh, an agricultural output, and there's hundreds of different ones that are captured by the FAO. So these are uh, using FAO data for the most part, but not only. Um, so you're doing this and then you're waiting for each country that growth rate by the share of the revenue in that country that that output represents. So this is what you're doing. You kind of average, doing a weighted average of the growth rate of the different individual outputs in each country, right? You're doing that for 170 countries, a lot of work. Then you do the same for the inputs, labor, materials, land, the change in how much uh, inputs, how many inputs were put into the agricultural uh, process and and the S here measures the cost share, the share that it takes uh, in terms of all the costs, like what is the share um, in value. So, so, so you get a sense that this is capturing the chain, you know, the growth rate in outputs minus the growth rate in inputs. And that gives us the change in productivity from one year to the next for each country. Okay. Um, bunch of data, there's a, there's a reason why this is a US agency that is doing this or an agency. It's not an individual researcher. This takes so much time to put together. There's a lot of quality checks that need to go in through the data. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I can talk about more about data quality issues up, up down, down the road if you're interested in talking about this. So, so this is uh, figure one in the paper. Well, part of figure one, there's a three first panel. So just showing the raw data, I think it's always very important to just show the raw data. Um, the, the, the gray lines here in panel A are the growth, the, the levels of, um, of, out, of TFP change for each country in the sample. So 172 lines you see uh, uh, there. And, and, and here I, I, I sort of aggregated them by, uh, by groups. So you see that some countries um, are, are seeing fast productivity growth. Other countries are seeing stagnating productivity growth. And on average, uh, you know, it, the average is uh, shown here in, in red. You can see the countries here mapped at the bottom in this map. So in terms of the, these categories match. So you see the countries are stagnating are here shown in yellow. The countries are going very fast or in dark blue, China, uh, you know, Brazil and, and some other countries um, uh, as well. Um, you, and, and the US is a, a very uh, a sort of stable, it's been growing at a f decent rate for, you know, for almost a hundred years. So it, it's uh, um, unlike these other countries are growing particularly uh, in recent times over the past, uh, say, 20, 30 years. Okay, this uh, panel B shows you the growth rates uh, for each year, shows you the distribution um, of the growth rates, um, you know, in log points uh, for every year. So you see that we're, the countries are not doing sort of bad 
in the same way every year. So you have some years, uh, you have countries doing well relatively to pre previous year and other places is going down just because weather, con you know, potentially weather conditions are very different in different parts of the world. So part of this variation is, is weather, but part of this variation are other factors, right? So this is just drawing, showing you the raw data. So this is in terms of the um, ag data, the weather data, we use a gridded product um, uh, that the, uh, a group at Princeton puts together. The global meteorological forcing data set is a gridded data set with a 0.25 uh, degrees uh, spatial resolution. Um, it goes from 1948 to 2016. And you can see here, I picked France because it's a relatively you know, small country so that we can see the grids. The US is too large so just to show that I could have done a state. But this gives you a sense of um, kind of the size of these grids over a country. And in order to aggregate to each country, the weather conditions for each country, we account for where agriculture is. So this is a, a map showing you where the cropland in France is located. And so we do the same thing here for every country in the world. You see here in the US, you see where you know, it's basically capturing kind of the corn belt, uh, you know, in the central plains. Um, and, um, and so it's really capturing kind of the density where agriculture is occurring. So we account for those weather conditions. So for the US, we're not, we don't use weather from the Rockies, right? Uh, to determine what the agriculturally relevant weather is. Um, so, so that's one, um, uh, how we aggregate up. So we, we use different weights, cropland weights, pasture weights, or cropland plus pasture weights. Um, and the variables that we rely on, we have minimum temperature, uh, um, uh, maximum temperature and precipitation. We also work with average uh, temperature, um, but that, you know, it's just by average in T-min and T-max um, there. Okay, so we do all of this aggregation for every country, for every month. Um, one important feature here is that, and I get this question a lot, like, you know, uh, you can do the analysis for the whole year, aggregating weather conditions through the whole year. What agriculture happens in specific parts of the year in, um, in, in certain countries. So in order to accommodate this idea that, you know, there's growing seasons, although remember that here we have livestock as well. So we have, we have a lot more than just crops uh, in the study. So, but we still did this uh, and we defined a, a green season. Uh, and so our green season is uh, sort of a, 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 um, a, a period of time center around the greenest month in each country. So, so what I'm showing you here is data taken from NDVI, so greenness index, and we computed for every place in the world, what is the greenest month in each location. We look where most of the cropland uh, or pasture is in each one of these countries, within countries, and then use that window around that greenest month where the agricultural activities are in each country to construct a window around that. We actually have a different uh, another model like green season and, and, and brown season. So we have a model with two seasons as well. Uh, although I'm not gonna get uh, too much into the wizard, results don't change much when we, when we try that. So, so when I talk about green season, that's kind of our baseline model. We, we use this uh, green season. And then the contrafactual weather trajectories, I already spoke about them when I was talking about the, uh, the, the, the approach. Um, um, so we use these two experiments, a historical and the ISNAT. Uh, to get this, and you can see at the country level, right? This is CIMIP 6 data, by the way. Um, so we're not going to use CIMIP 5, we're using CIMIP 7 models from CIMIP 6. And you see that the global average temperatures are rising uh, um, a lot, you know, in line with the observations, global observations taken from the GMFD. Uh, um, and though, uh, that warming would have happened, uh, you know, doesn't happen when you remove the human forcing from the climate models. So very similar to the plot that we saw before. Um, that I, I took from the web. So uh, this is just for CIMIP 6 and, se and 7 climate models. Okay, now results, okay? So I've set up a lot of stuff. So now let's see the results. So this is our baseline model already presented it. We have uh, these uh, dummies trying to capture things that don't vary, you know, uh, um, control for uh, growth rates in different countries. And, uh, but the, what we're really interested in is in these parameters, the how, changes in temperature, in green season temperature, and changes in, in green season precipitation are gonna change, are gonna affect productivity uh, growth um, at the country uh, level. Um, to get this uncertainty, uh, you know, we estimate this model with a bootstrap, um, with a block bootstrap to maintain um, sort of the dependence of observations um, at a regional scale. So this is how 
the response functions look like. This is a result of step one, okay? So you, on the left, you see the response function. I was showing you kind of a hypothetical one, uh, but this is the, the, the real thing on uh, at the global scale, how temperature change affects a TFP change, total factor productivity change. And what's striking is that you see a monotonically decreasing, right? It's, I, I was expecting something more like, um, at the beginning at least, uh, something more like precipitation here on the right, where there's kind of an optimal level of precipitation here. But when we, what we see on the left for temperature is that when we focus on the green season, higher temperatures just tend to be bad across the board, uh, whether you're in a colder country or whether you're in a uh, um, uh, warmer country. Um, and the only time that we get something more like what we see for precipitation on the right is when we use weather conditions for the whole year. When we hone in on the green season, we get this uh, linear, you know, kind of downward sloping. So, so this is where things, you can already anticipate where this is going. The world is warmer than it would have been without human forcing. And agriculture doesn't like, <laughs> at a global scale, doesn't like hotter temperatures. So you can already anticipate that, um, that anthropogenic climate change has not helped productivity growth, right? Um, and so when we actually combine these two, so when we combine the response function here with the climate models and we, we combine um, uh, these two sources of uncertainty, this is the cumulative impact of anthropogenic climate change on global agricultural productivity since 1961. And so each one of these spaghettis that you see there is a combination of a one bootstrap estimate from the statistical model and one GCM at random. And so we have 2000 spaghettis there showing kind of that meshing between the statistical uncertainty and the climate uncertainty. And when you look over all that uncertainty at, at 2020, as of 2020, that cumulative impact is around minus 21%. Uh, since 1961, uh, with a confidence band here, 90% 90, 90 confidence band that were minus 11 uh, and minus 36. So what does that mean? Like, is this big or large? Like, just to put it in context, we can think about it in levels. So this is in terms of changes, uh, you know, log changes or percentage changes. We can put it in terms of levels. So this uh, compares to the figure that I showed, um, or figure one at the beginning, where sh I was showing the global average temper uh, global average growth in productivity here in red. This is what we we saw we're seeing in our world, right, in red. And the contrafactual without human forcing would be here. The spaghetti is in gray, right. So what this is telling you is that productivity would have been higher without anthropogenic uh, forcings than we actually got. Okay. How much, how much higher? One way to think about this is the level that of productivity that we reached in 2020 would have been reached in 2013 in this contrafactual world without anthropogenic climate change. So in a way, since 1960, it's as if climate, anthropogenic climate change has slowed down global agricultural productivity by about seven years over that whole you know, 60 year period between 1960 and 2020, okay? So it's, it's, it's like shaving a little bit of productivity every year. And when you add all the shaving from year to year, it adds up to seven years that we've lost uh, due to uh, anthropogenic climate change. This is one model, right? Um, um, this is one model. We tried a bunch of different models. Um, so many that they don't even fit in a figure for me to show you all the results. But the, the basic model that we show, that I showed you there um, is exactly this one. One with average temperature that includes precipitation, that has a quadratic functional form that is symmetric, um, that uses regression weights that are equal. So we treat small countries and large countries in the same way. That where the weather data is aggregated over cropland only, not over you know, pastures. Um, where we look at the, the green season, um, where we don't allow the response function to be different across different latitudes, maybe it is. Um, and then where we don't include any of the countries and we don't include any of the years in the analysis. We try all the combinations that you can think of. We completely saturate everything. We try all the combinations of all, all these dimensions 
And this is what you get. This is on a subset. I cannot show you. You have to look at the paper to see the whole uh, band. So this is our, all the models that don't exclude data. And the model that I showed you, the minus 21% that I told you before, is exactly here in blue. This is the model that I showed you uh, that I talk about over the past you know, 40 minutes. That's the main model. But look at these, all these other models, right? They're all negative, right? They're all negative. Some point to slightly more positive results, some point to slightly more negative results. So it's not as if I just cherry pick the model and show you the one that was convenient for me. Uh, the model that we are showing here is well within the range of the uh, other models, uh, no matter how you relax the, the econometric model uh, that, we, that we consider, okay? So a bunch of changes, a lot of things uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper to, that, that you can explore. Um, in terms now of the regional impacts, now this is, this, is, this is a global picture, right? So this is a global picture. Um, th this bands here, remember each band re uh, it captures the statistical uncertainty and the climate uncertainty. And then when you look at across all of these models, it's also accounting for the model uncertainty, the econometric model uncertainty. So these figures now, these regional um, models, sample the three sources of uncertainty, the model uncertainty, the statistical uncertainty, uh, and the climate uncertainty. And what you see at the global scale is that we have an impact that is about you know, minus 20%, which is close to what we found in our baseline, baseline model. Uh, and these are the confidence uh, intervals around that number. And then you can see, depending on the region, it can be more or less uncertain, but you tend to see that the areas are more affected, tend to be areas are warmer, okay? If we're talking about Africa, uh, um, you know, parts of Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, where the effects are much larger already, okay? So uh, parts in Europe have actually suffered less, right? Although it still remains fairly uncertain, um, the 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 uh, the effects are larger in warmer areas. You see the here the uncertainty is much wider. As you go down to to smaller regions, the uncertainty grow, goes up. Okay, so there's more research that needs to be done to sort of uh, get a better sense of these regional impacts or country level impacts. And actually, uh, you know, uh, with my team, we're working on um, uh, subsequent studies trying to. Uh, come up with uh, more regional, uh, more regional estimates of this. This is a, th the same map, although it doesn't show the uncertainty for the country level impacts. So again, warmer countries tend to be uh, being uh, are affected um, uh, more than uh, cooler countries. Although the uncertainty is even larger uh, when you go to the country level uh, um, uh, level for the analysis. I'm, I'm almost done, but uh, here's one very interesting thing that we found in our study. One of the things is that we want we wonder how is you is global agriculture adapting to the changes that we're seeing. One way to think about this is well, if if global agriculture is adapting to warmer temperatures then we should see a change in how warmer temperatures affect productivity on any given year, right? Um, so we wanna see whether that response function is changing over time. So what we did is that we split the sample in two and we estimated the response function for before 1988 and after 1988. And we am overlaying exactly what the response function looks like between those two early and later period. In the dashed line here, I'm showing what I showed before, which is kind of when I don't separate uh, between two, you know, first and second half, we have kind of the average effect across all years, right? Um, so what you see here is that the response function was flatter before than it, it is now. So what this is saying is that although productivity is higher, uh, you know, in recent times, when a hot year occurs, productivity tends to drop more than it used to drop in the 60s and 70s and 80s, okay? So there's an increasing sensitivity, appears to be an increasing sensitivity of uh, global agriculture to, to these extreme uh, weather events, particularly temperature events. Um, there, there are potential alternative explanations to this. It might be related to the data, uh, you know, so this is not a really a central part of the analysis, although it's a, a puzzling, a finding that we get, 
um, but it definitely needs a, a, a more more attention given that we're heading to a world that is considerably warmer, right? So these are the trends that we're heading. Uh, you know, maybe that's not the uh, ideal strategy. Um, so that's what I had in terms of the conclusions or a bunch of limitations. Uh, one uh, that I, I I often get this question and is like how to think about this contrafact uh, about this um, contrafactual um, and 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 the results that I we showed here should not be interpreted as a, the effect of a world without fossil fuels. It's actually just a world without anthropogenic climate change. The difference is important because fossil fuels have fueled, no pun intended, have fueled uh, the development of inputs. And it, 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 because of the fossil fuels were richer in many ways than we would have been without fossil fuels. So all that wealth has also allowed us to invest in R&D in agriculture and make agriculture more productive. So that part, we're not taking away from the contrafactual, right? The way that we're thinking about this is if you had like a magic wand and you can change the rules of physics where when you put CO2 out in the atmosphere, it doesn't change the climate system, then that's really the effect that we're isolating, okay? And I think it's a useful contrafactual because I don't think we necessarily wanna live, you know, go back in time and uh, not live without fossil fuels. It's, I can understand the point now that we wanna move away from them, but, the, it's, it's not very useful mental uh, exercise to think about that. I think it's more useful to think about how much anthropogenic climate change is already affecting us and quantifying that. And this is what um, our exercise is trying to do. So we don't remove R&D. We don't remove CO2 either uh, from, uh, from, from this. Um, and there's also issues with the, some aspects of the quality of the data, uh, in the FAO data. Uh, that I can get into. So in, in a nutshell, this is a paper in one slide. So the research question, right? We wanted to know how much has anthropogenic climate change already affected global agricultural productivity. We get the best data that we could get to answer this question. So a, a global panel, uh, longitudinal data set um, on uh, agricultural TFP at the country level. And we match that with fine scale uh, weather data for each country. We estimate that econometric model right, to capture the statistical uncertainty between TFP growth and weather change. Uh, and we try a bunch of models uh, uh, in that step. And then we link those with output from GCMs from CIMIP6 uh, to sort of uh, combine them and find out the cumulative impact on, on productivity growth in, since the 1960s. So what we find is yes, there's been an effect, about 20% drop in, in, in TFP in productivity uh, with uncertainty obviously around it. So that's about seven years of lost growth in TFP. Um, over the past uh, 60 years, okay? So there's also uncertainty around that number between four and 12 and 13 uh, years. Uh, and the impacts appear to be larger in warmer countries. Um, and that sensitivity to high temperatures appears to be becoming more severe, right? So that's where I showed you uh, that increasingly uh, downward sloping uh, response function at the global scale. So that's what I have for today. I think I'm a minute about, you know, beyond my 50 minute uh, time. Uh, so you can, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter or write me an email, or you can read the preprint uh, on that link um, uh, if you want to take a look at the paper. There's also the code and data directly linked in the paper. So if you want to reproduce the results of the study, you can do so. Okay, so thank you for your time. So thank you very much, Ariel. Um, Great. I have to give you virtual applause. Okay. <laughs> very enjoyable talk. Yeah. Thank um, you. There's and, a bunch um, of questions. I think we have time for questions. So I will um, maybe let you, um, I think there are 25 now. So maybe more. Ooh, this is more, more than, than I can, can choose. Let me drink then. Answer. Um, um, maybe the more general ones are at the end, but I'll. Um, let you okay, so so I'll forward. start. Then I'll start from uh, the bottom up. Then, um, so so Jessamyn Bailey um, asks, what biological mechanisms might be behind an increased sensitivity of crops and warming, or is it not a biological mechanism behind this? That's a great question. It is unclear to me. I the the I have um, the paper that I told at the beginning um, of the talk. We uh, we find a similar pattern in U.S. agriculture. And in that paper, we had better data, more detailed data, and we could actually tie, we could, there were two components. One was about uh, the specialization of agriculture. 
uh, in the Midwest, for instance, and here in the US where you're, you're moving from a, a more diverse agriculture where you have livestock and, and crop agriculture in the same place to specializing. So where you have more emphasis on crop production in the Midwest. But we also find that that crop production in itself is getting more uh, sensitive. So at least in the US context, there's, there's, there's a sense that uh, there's several things happening but some of them might be biological. There's a paper in, in Science 2014 by David Lobel, who's a co-author here, uh, where they, they also find that for corn yields um, in three Midwestern states. So there's, there's um, he, he ties it to, in that paper, they speculate that it might be related to planting density. Um, and, uh, and so it's more management uh, than, but it's a combination between management and, 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 and biology. So unclear why this is showing up at the global scale. Um, so yeah, so, so, so let's see. Um, let me see. Oh, I got more questions. What I was, uh, let me see. Um, so good to meet you. Greetings for Cornell. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Julie, good. So how could sustainable agriculture and, and living affect this data? Um, so I'm, I'm unclear exactly what, Eliana, what you're trying to get at here. Um, so any, so the way that I would think about this is, um, this is missing a lot of things. So the productivity data is missing the environmental footprint of agriculture, right? So if agriculture is polluting in certain parts of the world, this is not being captured in this. And there's actually people, there's a, a group of economists at the OECD, uh, there's a working group there I'm a part of, we're trying to come up with ways of capturing that environmental footprint in, um, in national statistics. Um, so there's work going that direction. So it might change how productive we might look, right? Um, especially if you think about two farmers, one uh, trying to reduce pollution and the other one not trying to reduce pollution. You know, uh, one, if you only look at the output that the farmer can sell, the one who's devoting more resources to pro in protecting the environment might look on paper as less productive, right? Because he has to devote all these inputs to caring about the environment, right? So that's an unfair way of measuring productivity. So that's one, one reason why you might want to account for this, uh, that because some countries are investing more in environmental protection than others, so, but, but great question. Uh, Ariana, Ariana asks, it seems that there might have been a positive relationship between warmer weather and agricultural inputs, how this relationship catch in the government model. That's a, a good question. The way that we go around that is by using changes from year to year, right? So, um, if we only had trends, right? So inputs are trending up uh, and, and, and conditions are getting warmer, then you might have that confounding. But here what we're looking is that from year to year, right? What is the change, right? And so because weather conditions are, you know, whether it's gonna be warmer a warmer year or a cooler year or wetter year is random. We, it, you cannot really anticipate that uh, ahead of time. Um, your 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 the assumption is that those weather surprises are orthogonal to pre to pre planned choices about inputs, right? The only thing that you can see in the data is that the farmers responding to what they could in that year, right? Um, so that's how we kind of uh, in the paper talk about how do we uh, avoid kind of confounding, uh, so that we're only looking at these changes over time and not uh, time invariant confounders. I'm not sure if this, you mentioned this earlier. Uh, do, uh, so this is Aiden asking a question. Um, but do any crops become more productive because of the changing climate? It could be. It could be. Uh, and, and if it is, then it, could, it would be reflected in one way or another in the, in the study. So um, it's a global study. So there's a lot of details that you might not get. Um, that might be the fact that you could see like the uh, cooler uh, regions there's a blue, you know, they were shown in blue in the map. Well, it looks like they might be benefiting. For some models, it looks like those countries might be benefiting. So that might be a reflection of that. So it's possible that it goes in that direction as well. When we look at the overall range of uh, uh, econometric models and not only the one that I showed you, kind of the baseline one. So that's why it's important to sample across uh, climate models as well. Uh, I mean, econometric models as well with that band with all the with, with all the estimates. Uh, so Peter, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ariel. Does productivity drop more in recent decades because productivity has increased? In other words, is it uh, because yields are higher in good years? 
so it could be so know that these are these are logs right so um so it's not just a numerical uh, issue where um you know you, you know um where where say you go from 100 you know 100 uh, bushels per acre and then you drop to 70 and then you go to 200 bushels and you drop to um uh, to 140 it's the same percentage drop but it looks more you know bigger in just in in, in raw level in, in without transformation uh, down in time here it's logged right so it's percentage wise it's dropping more right one speculation and we didn't check this it could there might be data uh, issues if you go back in time is the weather data the measurement error in the weather data the same in early time periods and later time periods if the quality of the weather data has changed over time which it might have then if if you have white noise in the old data then we tend to have attenuation um, on the estimates in early time periods we didn't rule that out so that's why we don't put you know we don't put so much emphasis on that result uh and it's not a core part of the the main story of the paper it's just something that we found so it's unclear i don't i wouldn't bet on exactly that this is that part would survive um all type of uh you know uh, challenges um but it's something that is just you know i think it's worth uh exploring um uh, is tfp so jack asks a question is tfp uh, crop sensitive or generalized to describe all agriculture, so everything is embedded in there. Um, uh, crops, livestock, it's very tricky to get TFP for just crops or TFP um, uh, for livestock. And the reason is that you need to then allocate the inputs for the different outputs. And if you look at just a normal farm, they can have, you know, they, 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 they use labor for crop production and for animal production. So you cannot really disentangle where is that input being allocated. Uh, you cannot even do that in a, in a single farm. <laughs> Imagine having country level data and wanting to separate, you know, kind of the hours devoted to one, like it's just uh, not really practical. And so generally you cannot really uh, do these um, uh, TFP by type of output. Uh, you put all the outputs and all the inputs and it's a kind of multi output uh, uh, production process. Uh, but, that, uh, but good question. One thing that you can do, is do the analysis by outputs, right? So, so, um, and we did that in the in the paper that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, uh, for U.S. agriculture, we have TFP, which is everything um, for a particular region. But then you can just look at crop output or livestock output, or sort of these are the 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 components of TFP. You can also do the analysis on those, right? Um, what is the relationship between, uh, so then uh, Emma is asking, what is the relationship between atmospheric CO2 concentration and TFP? Uh, we don't know, the study didn't tackle that. Um, we, there's no way to remove that in the econometric model, not simply, there's some work um, that by the way, David Lobel has tried to do with crop yields. Um, I don't know. I don't know how much that has changed, you know, influenced TFP, that's a good question, but our analysis did not, was not able to remove uh, CO2. It just could remove all the kind of um, uh, climate climate components of, uh, of our forcing, right? Um, Julie asked a question, original temperature increase were attributed to damage to the ozone layer, which was growing and, and had direct health effects. We now have, uh, we have, uh, we now have not just increased temperature, also changing where the temperatures are changing in relationship to each other. Yes, okay, so, so as long as, the only the way that we capture this is whatever is coming out of the GCMs, right? So um, if there's changes in the ozone layer or regional patterns, in, in, to the extent that they're captured in the historical and ISNAT experiments, that is the only source of variation that we're capturing uh, there. Uh, it's possible to do a bunch of other, other things, but you know, I, I think running climate models is is uh you know is difficult uh, very computing you know intensive and uh and so we you know we had to go with the data that is posted online uh for this um but thanks for the question then uh fish farms and other kinds so wolfar is asking if fish farms and other kinds of aquatic agriculture affect in the study that's a, a great question i need to double check but the last time um i don't think aquaculture is reflected in in this data um so i don't think it is um, which is a, a 
you know, uh, sort of a, a, an important uh, piece of this. Uh, how much uh, would it, um, uh, how, how big would it be? So that's a great question. It's not actually reflected here um, in the data set. It's mostly like, you know, crops, mostly land stuff, but, you know, you can have uh, agriculture in land. So, um, so it's actually not reflected here, but, but that's a good point. I haven't seen much work on, on aquaculture and climate change impacts uh, either. So, but interesting. Uh, Wolf also asked a question, is the global transitions to more plant-based diet, uh, how will that affect global agricultural productivity? That's a good question. I, there's no way in this study we can really tell. We would have to have a model link, like a model of, um, of demand to, for agricultural products and then a supply of agricultural products. And then that's how you could simulate that. Um, then you have to assume that people change their diets, right? Which is kind of a challenging because as you start having people moving away from um, animal proteins, uh, you know, you might have the prices of animal proteins go down, which make them more appealing because they're going cheaper. Then you have more people to buy. It. So, um, you know, so, so, so you have to make some assumptions about uh, either um, making uh, animal agriculture more expensive, uh, good luck, <laughs> or making, you know, uh, coming up with substitutes that are as, you know, good as the other ones that just regular consumers would just uh, find appealing into that. So that's how I would try to model. You, you need to model the supply and demand to, to try to get at this. It wouldn't necessarily change the productivity. It would change probably, um, well, it could change in retrospect, like where do we invest our, you know, our R&D, right? So that could change. So, but I don't think we can do that retrospectively without some strong assumptions about the structure of the problem, but uh, interesting question. Uh, Ella, could these empirical and conceptual models potentially help educate people who are climate skeptics or don't necessarily believe there is a problem? Well, um, let's start with the people who, I would, that's a good question. I would even start with the people who do think it's a problem, but think that's a problem in 50 years. <laughs> those are, those, those are very important uh, people to inform, right? Because they might think, yeah, I think climate change is real, but, and then we are, uh, you know, we're responsible for it, but that's a problem for my grandchildren, not for me. And then when you show this and you say like, well, the impacts are, it, they're not about the future. We are already lost seven years of productivity growth. Um, and, and, you know, and we can quantify this and look, right? I think that might be uh, getting that the middle people is probably for political, uh, exp you know, for political reasons might be even, more rewarding or have a higher return to change public policy than going for the fringe people who think the, the earth is flat, right? Like that the, the GCM wouldn't even work, right? Like, you know, like for them, like, ah, 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 round earth, like ah, you, you, you know, like that, yeah, that, that, there's so many things that you need to do to get those people on board that, uh, you know, maybe there, there's a, a bigger, uh, a wider range of people that um, might be um, better to, you know, uh, that we should be informing um, more, right? Um, does agricultural model, so whoever asked the question, agricultural model capture illicit crop growth, um, or is that, an, uh, you're talking about weed and stuff like that. Uh, I don't think it's big enough to show up here and it, it, wouldn't, be sh it wouldn't show up because it's not in the FAO accounts. So it wouldn't show up. Uh, it would be a small share too um, uh, in the whole output. Um, how accurate are our estimates of human forcing agents and influences? I hope I had uh, Toby or Carlos here uh, to tell me exactly how much they trust their, uh, the forcing that go in. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, um, um, you know, but good question. Uh, does this model take into account how climate change is beneficial for some crops in some areas? Yeah, I think I answered this question. It, it, it would, um, it would as we allow the marginal effects to be different in different climates, right? Or how we relax the idea that the response functions might be different in different latitudes. So we allow for all of that in a model. And so that would be reflected in the, in the uh, results as well. So um, you might say, well, you can be growing things that, you know, there's always more detail that you're getting into, but with the data that we have, we cannot get more kind of resolution on, on these fine, fine scale uh, questions that we're trying to get in with, with new work. Um, so Julianne asked the question, we have technology again, robotics are replacing labor business models and, and multi-business models are related to the government fund availability. Yeah, so 
<clears throat> yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, transformations in the agricultural sector happening. Some of these are being reflected in the productivity data that we're showing, right? Um, and this study is not saying that we should take one technological, you know, one technology versus the other. It's just reflecting how much more we're producing with the inputs that we're putting in. Uh, so it's uh, pretty, I actually recently got the news that I got a grant uh, from USDA to study R&D in a changing climate. So like the nature of the research and development that needs to happen in order to counterbalance this projected uh, impacts of climate change uh, uh, in US agricultural, uh, in the US agricultural sector. So that's something that I'm definitely uh, interested in. Um, let me see, I'm, I'm getting close. Uh, what do you think are the limits uh, of numerical models? So these are not, well, uh, if, um, so the, we have an econometric model and then are you talking about the numerical models in terms of kind of the GCMs? Um, um, if that's the case, well, you know, I'm sure that the climate scientists will know to, you know, uh, that's why they want always like bigger, you know, more computers, more sophisticated models. So I, I bet that, uh, you know, that they can come up with a lot, a, a list of things that they want, right? Um, but, you know, they're, they're computing, you know, they're very intensive. If we're talking about GCMs, like they're very intensive, very costly can only run them in like in supercomputers and things like that. And not everyone has a supercomputer. Uh, so those are barriers to entry uh, to, you know, to, to research, right? Every time you put these, uh, you know, barriers and you keep people out. Um, so, um, so those are, there are issues there, right? Um, in terms of uh, access to, uh, to science. Um, so could you give some examples of inputs used for DCFP calculations? Uh, so, you know, labor. Um, so labor can be um, adjusted in terms of quality. Generally, they do this with like levels of education uh, of the labor force. Um, land, right? Also quality adjusted. If it's irrigated, there's a factor that they makes the land look like bigger in, in your accounts. Um, materials, anything that you buy, you know, because you have pesticides, herbicides, uh, capital, so like machinery and stuff like that. Uh, so those are kind of the types of inputs that go into into these uh, into these accounts, uh, and there's a bunch of the FAO gives track of, of many of these um, Ariel, from YouTube. Yeah, it's four o'clock, so yeah. you've been asking <laughs> question answering questions for a long time. Yeah. So, um, there's so much. It's, this there's is great. Uh, so I've never much? seen so many questions in a seminar. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, it's you might want to um, leave now. <laughs> and have um, people read the paper. Yeah. And um, so um, thank you so much for coming in and um, okay. here's some more virtual applause. And thank you. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. And there's certainly lots of, lots of interest in the, in the topic. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the invite. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And then you can always look at the paper uh, that should be coming out soon. Maybe like in a month. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All Thanks right. for the invite. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.